Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 669, born November 26th, 2017. Coming up in just a few minutes. It's home for me. You know, although I wasn't born there, I grew up there. So a lot of the guys that are on Shift, you know, they were, I went to school with them as well. My wife's from these parts. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's home. It's home. Wick is not at the end of the road in northern Scotland, but it's pretty close. It's not a place you just wind up in, but that's what happened when Malcolm Waring first went to work at the Pulteney Distillery about 30 years ago. And now there's no place he'd rather be. More with Pulteney Distillery Manager Malcolm Waring later on WhiskeyCast In-Depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, and in the What I'm Tasting This Week department. Well, you'll just have to wait for that one. It's all coming up on this week's WhiskeyCast. The holidays are a time to celebrate, to share something special with friends and family. This year, why not consider sharing something truly special? An engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know... No red breast. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Scotland's newest distillery opened its doors to the public this week. The Clydeside Distillery on the banks of the River Clyde at the Queen's Dock in Glasgow marks the return of the Morrison family to distilling. Two decades after Morrison Beaumore Distillers was sold to Suntory in 1996. Tim Morrison has been running the A.D. Rattray Independent Bottling House since then, along with his son Andrew. Several years ago, they started working on plans for the distillery, and as Andrew Morrison told me this week, they decided to bring distilling back into the heart of Glasgow. We really wanted to try and do something unique, and bringing distillation to a city centre was something that we felt uh, was kind of a unique proposition at the time, and... uh, that's when we started looking for land that worked and also, uh, you know, a, a council that was going to be supportive of that because the last thing we wanted to do is try and push forward with that and find roadblocks along the way. But we really wanted to make sure the council was supportive. So we met with them and, and when they gave us the green light in principle, we knew that's when we could uh, start the hard work and secure the land and order the stills and, and try and push for planning. And you guys really sort of uh, set the uh, the trend here because uh, since you started work on this five years ago, there's been a whole bunch of urban distilleries popping up all over Glasgow and Edinburgh. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the inevitable thing where, you know, everyone knows the challenges of trying to build a new distillery and finance it until you have stock available in the market, particularly if, like us, you're not focusing on gin or anything, you're purely looking at single malt as your um, go-to spirit. So, you know, the, the, the obvious question is, how do we try and generate some revenue stream in those three years? And, you know, as scenic as some of these Highland distilleries are, the level of tourists coming through Glasgow and Edinburgh is obviously significantly higher and more condensed. And so if you can catch the right niche there, uh, potentially you have a, you know, a much larger, larger audience coming through early doors and, you know, paying the admission fee and coming and people perhaps that wouldn't otherwise travel to Isla or to the Highlands to see a distillery. So it's really a new customer base, hopefully. So I, I can see why people like it in principle, it comes with its challenges as well. Like I said, planning is never easy when you're in a city center distillery, but it looks like, uh, as you said, we hopefully set the way and, and it's great to see all these new things popping up in Scotland. Tell me about the site that you picked right on the riverside. So the site is uh, the pump house building, which is quite hard to describe until you see the overhead views, but uh, the Clyde was one of the most famous shipping ports, uh, certainly in Britain, and if not around the world. Uh, 
And the Queen's Dock was a huge shipping yard with warehousing that uh, warehoused the whiskey, some rums, sugar, spices, all these things that were transported around the world from the Queen's Dock. And the pump house was uh, the controlling system for the hydraulic gate that uh, controlled access into the uh, Queen's Dock. And so the pump house itself was built in 1877. And when it was, it was, pretty much getting in a derelict state when we secured the land but we saw the potential in the land we have great uh, facilities around us we have the riverside museum which is uh, the glasgow transport museum um, just along the river from us which attracts over a million visitors a year and on the other side of us we have the secc which is the scottish exhibition and conference center and uh, that's the largest one in Scotland. And just next to that, we have the, the Hydro, which is a live music venue. So the, this section of the Clyde is really regenerated well. Uh, lots of uh, great events going on, lots of activity. And so we thought it would be a really great location for a distillery. And I think that's one of the reasons why the council was so supportive is because we were adding to the the grand plan of the Clyde site. And uh, one one of the conditions was, of course, though, that you know, dealing with a listed building has its own challenges, but uh, we, the conditions from uh, the city council were that, or the planning authority was that the additional building for the distillery had to be quite contemporary. And so the distillery building itself is zinc cladded with lots of glass, uh, and the pump house is obviously original stonework from 1877. So there's a really nice contrast there. And you've already started distilling too, right? Yes, we're about three weeks into distillation now. Uh, so that's, and, and that was always the danger is, is you're viewed as a tourist attraction, but certainly our focus is uh, on producing a really, really good quality spirit. And we're distillers first and foremost. And uh, we have a really great distilling team headed by Alistair McDonald, formerly of Ockentoshan Distillery, who actually used to work at uh, Bowmore Distillery uh, back when my family were involved in it. So it's a great connection there. When do you think you'll finally release the first whiskey from Clydeside? Three years? You're going to wait an extra year or two? What do you think? You know, you know I think we have certain hopes in our head depending. I mean, one of the, the things we've really made a priority is our wood purchasing. We're, we're sourcing and investing really heavily on our wood. So the hope is that you'll have good spirit at a young age, but certainly we're, we're not going to force it if it's not there. Um, that's not what we want to do. We want to uh, make sure it's good spirit. If that happens to be at three years, great. If it's four years, fantastic. Uh, if it takes five years, hopefully we can be that patient. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest out there. So it just depends on the volume that you release at. But certainly I would imagine something between three to four to four and a half years. But would that, like I say, is very dependent on samples and, and how it's all going in the woods. But we're in no rush. The one thing visitors to Clydeside will not see is maturing whiskey. The distillery doesn't have any warehousing on site and will be maturing its whiskey at warehouses in Scotland's central belt. In other news, Diageo has filed a lawsuit against former White & Mackay owner VJ Malia in the UK in an attempt to claw back the first $40 million of his severance package after he stepped down as chairman of India's United Spirits nearly two years ago. Diageo agreed to pay Malia $75 million over five years to get Malia to go away following continued allegations of financial improprieties at United Spirits. That $40 million was paid in 2016 as the first installment. Diageo is asking for $181 million from Malia to cover money that was moved from United Spirits to other Malia-controlled companies over the last several years with little or no oversight. Diageo bought a majority stake of United Spirits back in 2013 and has been trying to unwind the tangled web of transactions with Malia's other businesses ever since. He's currently in exile at his estate near London and fighting extradition back to India, where he's been accused of cheating 17 Indian banks out of more than a billion dollars in debt. The next court hearing in that case is scheduled for next week. 
Earlier this month, we reported that Diageo was reviewing its relationship with Hollywood producer and director Brett Ratner after news reports accusing him of a longtime pattern of sexual misconduct. The drinks giant partnered with Ratner two years ago to produce the Hillhaven Lodge American Whiskey, named after the historic Beverly Hills estate that Ratner owns. This week, JustDrinks.com reported that Diageo will discontinue the Hillhaven Lodge Whiskey. And there's one more story to report along these lines. It's a complex one. One of Louisville's top whiskey bars has closed indefinitely after the staff quit following a social media posting accusing the bar's owner of sexual misconduct. Louisville Business First reports the Haymarket Whiskey Bar's owner was accused of committing an act of misconduct back in 2013 in a Facebook post that went viral earlier this month. We are not naming the owner because no criminal charges have been filed. In fact, police told Louisville Business First that there's no investigation into the accusation because it has not been reported as a crime. The bar's owner and his attorney have denied any wrongdoing, but the Haymarket's website and social media accounts have been taken down, and the bar has been removed from the Urban Bourbon Trails website run by the Louisville Convention and Visitors Bureau. Once again, we have to emphasize no criminal charges have been filed. Last time around, we reported on the UK's Supreme Court ruling that will allow Scotland's minimum unit pricing scheme for alcoholic beverages to go into effect. Health Minister Shona Robeson announced this week that the plan will take effect on May 1st with a 50 pence per unit floor price. That would bring the base price for a 70 CL bottle of whiskey to 14 pounds, around $18.65 a bottle at current exchange rates. Meanwhile, Chancellor of the Exchequer Philip Hammond gave his autumn budget address Wednesday in London. And while the Scotch whiskey industry did not get the reduction in alcohol taxes it wanted, Hammond did drop his original plan to impose a 3.9% tax increase on whiskey and other spirits and froze taxes at current levels. That freeze will be in effect until the next budget address expected in March. On the business front, Remy Cointreau is investing in its two new whiskey distilleries, Westland in Seattle, Washington, and Domaine des Hautes Glaces in France. Remy acquired both distilleries around this time last year, and the company's latest earnings report for the first half of this fiscal year disclosed plans to increase production capacity at both distilleries while not giving any specifics. We'll have more details as they become available. Oregon-based Eastside Distilling is teaming up with country singer and entrepreneur John Rich to launch the Redneck Riviera whiskey brand. Rich created the Redneck Riviera lifestyle brand with a nightclub in Las Vegas and one opening in Nashville next year and is expanding into other areas as well as spirits. The project has been in the works for about a year now and represents a major expansion for Eastside, which is opening a new office in Tennessee to manage the brand, while CEO Grover Wickersham's Portland-based team will start bottling the first Redneck Riviera blended whiskey this week. John feels that the, the concept Redneck Riviera is kind of a state of mind uh, to a certain extent and, and not 100% geographical, but the Gulf Coast is the origin of the phrase, and that's where we're going to be initially rolling out. We'll be in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana, initially. And then, of course, Tennessee. Wickersham says the deal with John Rich is an equity partnership, unlike many other celebrity-linked lifestyle brands, where a spirits company licenses the brand and pays royalties based on annual sales. Now, the holiday season is usually the biggest time of the year for whiskey sales, so, as you might expect, we have a few new whiskeys to mention this week. Redemption Whiskey is releasing a new collection of vintage American whiskeys. The initial release of The Ancients includes a 36-year-old bourbon distilled back in 1978 and an 18-year-old barrel-proof rye. Both whiskeys were distilled at MGP in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, back in the days when it was owned by Seagram's, 
And here's an idea for you of just how much the angels can take out of a barrel of whiskey over time. Deutsch Family Wine and Spirits, which owns the Redemption brand, used four barrels to make that 36-year-old bourbon. They got a total of 18 bottles out of it. The price tag? $1,200 each. The rye will sell for around $400 a bottle. Beaumont is debuting a new series as well. The Vintners Trilogy starts off with an 18-year-old cask-strength single malt, matured in ex-bourbon and manzanilla sherry casks. It'll sell for around $127 a bottle. The 26-year-old wine-matured Beaumont was matured for 13 years in ex-bourbon barrels, then 13 more years in wine barriques. It'll carry a recommended retail price of $540 a bottle. The series will be completed late next year with a 27-year-old Beaumont. Meanwhile, Lafrog is releasing a 15-year-old Kerchus bottling exclusively to members of the Friends of Lafrog. It was distilled in 2002 and matured in First Fill X bourbon casks. It'll also be available at the distillery's shop on Isla for 80 pounds, around $107 a bottle. Australia's Sullivan's Cove Distillery is out with its first double cask bottling. It's matured in a combination of ex-tawny port and ex-bourbon barrels and bottled at 49.6% ABV with no-chill filtering. It'll sell for $170 Australian, about $129 U.S. Back in September, we reported on High Wire Distilling's unique South Carolina bourbon made with locally grown Jimmy Red Corn during episode 657. They've just released their latest batch of Jimmy Red bottled in special Le Creuset ceramic decanters. Limited amounts are available at the distillery in Charleston. Finally, let's give some credit to the folks at Wild Turkey. Earlier this month, the distillery's workers and volunteers delivered 4,500 turkeys to every home in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. The volunteers included actor Matthew McConaughey, who serves as the brand's creative director. The total also included 500 turkeys for the local food bank. The turkeys were donated by Butterball. And Wild Turkey also made a cash donation, equaling 50,000 Thanksgiving dinners to share our strength. Also on that front... Beam Suntory gave $100,000 to Operation Homefront, which supports military families around the U.S. That donation will provide holiday meals for more than 8,400 people. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park. So the argument, well, conversations at Thanksgiving dinner had you reaching for your noise-canceling headphones, huh? Well, Highland Park's full volume can push the mute button on those conversations and have you dreaming of the winds on Orkney instead of cringing over your uncle's hot air. Look for Highland Park's full volume at a whiskey shop near you. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. This week's Your Voice is brought to you by Lot 40. Earlier this week, I asked on Twitter what whiskeys those of you who celebrate Thanksgiving in the U.S. would be drinking, along with the turkey and pumpkin pie on Thursday. Lots of great responses. Here's one from Matthew Sammons at Sammons05 on Twitter. For the Sammons family Thanksgiving, I brought Weller 107. My brother brought this. He wins. He attached a photo of an Angel's Envy bottle engraved with Sammons family Thanksgiving. Well, as long as you're sharing both bottles, I think the whole family wins. Of course, that leaves some room for a shameless plug or two. And the folks at Davile Distillery in Wales, and that's at D-A-M-H-I-L-E on Twitter, sent this. We'll be sipping some of our latest batch of organic Welsh whiskey. 
Sherry Wong at Anagram2112 on Twitter sent, I have Maker's Mark, Jim Beam, Lagavulin, and Drambui. Eddie Clark at Buckfan609 tweeted from Phoenix, Like most here, I like bourbon straight. Having said that, made a great drink. Four ounces of pure cranberry juice, two ounces of bourbon, three quarters of an ounce of Cointreau, one ounce of pure maple syrup. Shake vigorously. Pour over an ice orb or large cubes in a highball. So good. Sounds interesting. Thanks, Eddie. Zach Becker tweeted from Kentucky. Must say the Whiskey Cast podcasts passed the six hours wonderfully getting to the in-laws. Now, time for a dram. Zach, I hope that's a desire to relax with a dram and not a reflection on the in-laws. And LCM at SCLC Prez on Twitter tweeted a photo of her and her father with whiskeys from Four Roses, Smooth Ambler, and High West. Dad and I had a mini tasting. He ended up asking me to bring out the Jim Beam. Dave Parker at Malt Troll tweeted from Canada, Got a chance to listen to the latest whiskey cast. Great to hear all the Canadian content. Oh, and got a chuckle from the comment, What the hell is cricket? Of course, that's a reference to my question to Andy Watts last time around, who went to South Africa to play professional cricket and wound up making whiskey. I never did get him to explain just how cricket works. But here's my offer to you cricket fans. You tell me how cricket works, and I'll explain baseball's infield fly rule to you. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. You can also record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And if you have Skype, you can leave us a voicemail there as well. Of course, you'll always find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr, the usual social media suspects, at whiskeycast. And this week's Your Voice is brought to you by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. Buffalo Trace Distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky has its annual Lighting of the Trace celebration this Thursday night, November 30th and holiday lighting displays every night from then through January 2nd. Maker's Mark Distillery in Loretto, Kentucky has its holiday candlelight tours and dinners on the first two Saturdays in December, the 2nd and the 9th. The Telegraph Whiskey Experience is December 4th and 5th in London. Copper and Oak in New York City has a Repeal Day bourbon tasting on December 5th, and Catoctin Creek Distillery has its own Repeal Day party that night in Purcellville, Virginia. Highland Park's Viking Invasion Tour will be at Snow Days in Vail, Colorado from December 8th through the 10th. Let's hope it snows that weekend. And McTeers has its final whiskey auction of the year on December 15th in Glasgow, Scotland. Right now, we have 132 different whiskey events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. We're adding new events each week. If you have a festival or a tasting coming up, just use the searchable calendar on our website and let us know all about it. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion, why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. Just like a perfectly executed double play, Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for Whiskeycast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo, North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Some jobs are so enjoyable that years can fly by, and before you know it, you've made it an entire career. I have one of those jobs. And so does Malcolm Waring. 
He started out at Pulteney Distillery in Wick, Scotland, 30 years or so ago, and worked his way up through the ranks, to the point where Inverhouse started moving him around to its other distilleries in Scotland for a while. He finally returned to Wick to manage Pulteney, and now you'd need a crowbar to pry him out of the place for more than a few days at a time. Fortunately, last week was one of those times. He made a brief stop in Fredericton, New Brunswick, for a whiskey dinner with the one and only Martine Nouet at the New Brunswick Spirits Festival. And we sat down to talk after dinner with a dram of his latest whiskey, Old Pulteney's new 1983 vintage. Malcolm, let's talk about this 1983 vintage, because uh, this predates your time at the distillery, but not by a whole lot, right? No, I started uh, later on in the 80s, but it was actually started off by a man called Neville Cook, and we called him Pappy. Pappy actually was from Newfoundland, so there's a very good Canadian connection with that. So Neville started off, he initially filled them into uh, what we call dump hoggies, started off life there. He put them, he had the foresight to put them up into high up in the racks in the warehouse. Bigger loss, but really intensified all the kind of coastal aspects to it as well and intensified all the flirts, the floral, the estuary, citrusy notes too. And then a number of years ago, I racked it into a good Spanish oak, a Galician oak, Miguel Martin cast. Miguel, he he seasoned them for two years in a, in a, a Spanish treated wine. And he, he emptied that out and brought it across to Pulteney then and we filled them. And I put them down into warehouse number six, was was the old kiln. And there's a, a earthy kind of environment there. And I really wanted to capture that in the European oak being a bit open structure there. It really took it in there and gave it a, a spiciness. It, gave it, it really highlighted all, like, it's like a, a spicy clementine, almost like a marmalade kind of mouthfeel to it initially. And at you know 46 percent, it was it, it really carries you know on your on your aftertaste. It really brings always the the fruits, the floral, the citrusy notes as well, but coupled with a spicy clementine. I love the orange on this, but it's not the typical old Pulteney flavor. It doesn't have that uh, brininess, that maritime note, the little bit of smoked salmon that you normally get from say the 17, the 21, even that new 25. Yeah, very much, and that's you know in essence that what we were trying to do. You know, so we vintage that. It's very limited. There's only 1,700 bottles. But it was something different that we wanted to bring out. It was not, you know, typical Pulteney in the terms of the DNA. We wanted to bring a different kind of style and a different dimension to it as well. So hopefully I've captured that in, in, in doing that. But the founding father, as I say, was Pappy. I can't take the credit for the distillation, but I can certainly take the credit for its maturation. Now, who makes that decision to re-rack it? You or Stuart Harvey, the master blender? Oh, it's in conjunction. It's, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not the only face behind this. You know, there's a team of us. You know, obviously, Stuart's one of them. I'm one of them and a few other guys, too. How did you wind up getting your start 30 years ago? Uh, well, it was a lovely gentleman called John Black. John Black was a very good friend of my wife's parents. John was a very keen golfer, as, was my, or as is my, my parents-in-law. Uh, he had an opening actually at the distillery and he said to my parents-in-law would Malcolm like to come and see me for an interview and I says yeah yeah so anyway I went along John says you know I've got an opening here you know you can start in a few weeks time uh, I'll get an organize an interview for you so I says that's fine he says I'll give you a shout so anyway about a week later there's a tap at the door just newly married young family and lo and behold John Black Malcolm, what size of boots do you take and what size of boiler suit? Told him, he says, I'll get an interview organised for you. He says, but can you start a week Monday, but I'll give you a shout for an interview. Aye, no problem. So I turned up on the Monday, 30 years ago, still waiting for my interview. Never got my interview yet, so hey-ho, we're here now. Well, let's think of this as the interview now. John Black had a long, pretty long history in the whiskey industry, didn't he? Oh, very much so, yeah. John John was an icon, you know. He's, he'd been around, he'd done a lot of things, he'd been all over. You know, his tenure he was at Pulteney as well, and he worked a lot in Speyside, you know, all, you know, Milton Duff Imperial, he'd been everywhere. And he eventually finished his career at, at Tullabardine. It was John was very, very instrumental in resurrecting T Tullabardine. And he passed on a couple of years ago, and uh, I know that had to be hard for you and for a lot of folks in the industry. Oh, very much a big mess, huge big mess, you know. Guys like these, you know, they don't come along every day. 
you know, and all that history, all that knowledge, you know, it's you know sadly gone. But John imparted his knowledge. He he was never backward in coming forward. John was a very keen helper of people. And if he seen somebody that had some kind of you know aspiration to try something and you know realize what they were doing, John kind of nurtured that and brought it on. And I, I really thank him for that. What's the best advice he ever gave you? Uh, Malcolm, have short pockets, big legs, enjoy your whiskey. Uh, it's, it's, it's it's a difficult thing to see. He he taught me he, not just the distilling aspects, but he taught me about people. You know, I always think you know you can make good whiskey, but whiskey that is that good has to be enjoyed with people and friends. John was very very much for that, and he showed me the way really to do that. The job of a distillery manager has changed over the years because uh, back in the day when you were getting your start. A manager like John Black was almost like the mayor of the town in terms of the influence they wielded. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, my my, my job's changed, uh, you know, big time over this last. I would say probably more so ten years. The industry's changed. You know, a lot of technology's changed. A lot of you know practices have changed. But you know, my job. I do things like this now. Actually, you know, ten, fifteen years ago, you know, a lot of guys wouldn't have done. But you know, there, there's 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 a lot of aspects to it now that probably wasn't there before. And a lot more technology that wasn't there before either. And I know you're not a big fan of all that, are you? Uh, I don't mind technology. I embrace it. You know, we've got to kind of, you got to move forward. Uh, I'm a traditionalist, you know. I, I, I always think, you know, making whiskey, you do it with your senses. You do it with your sight, your sound, your smell, you know, and you do it with feeling, you know. There's not there's not a computer going to do that. I realize and I understand, and I, I do have, you know, certain aspects in Pulteney that I have, you know, enhanced aids for the guys to, to, to work with as well. But, you know, it's very much hands-on, very much down to the man. You know, you, you want a human aspect into there, and you've got to have a person, I think. One of the other aspects of Pulteney that's unique is that sawed-off still at the top, where it, instead of the line arm coming up with that nice, graceful curve that we see at every other distillery in Scotland... We see this big flat plate on top, and it just sort of hangs off there on the side. I know there's a story behind that because we toured the distillery with you a few years ago. But tell that story again. Yeah, oh yeah. This is the days before calculators and and whatnot. And you know, it was the old slide rule and the abacus and the back of the fag packet calculations. The uh, they were increasing the the distills or replacing the stills. I think it was around about the 1920s. And obviously they got their calculations wrong because when the still was delivered and dropped in, they couldn't actually get the, the roof back on. The still was too tall. So they cut the swan neck off and stuck the light pipe on the side, which, you know, being very innovative and got the actual job done and got us working again, you know, probably what maybe they didn't realize at the time is the influence that it has on the spirit that we produce today. You know, it's producing a very big, boily, veggie, you know, a really big, robust, slightly sulfur new mix spirit. You know, it's hitting that flat top and it's just reflux back right into the pot again just to come back over. So eventually it works its way down the line arm. So it really has a huge, big influence on, on the style of Pulteney. How did it change from the time before? Well, if I could get a bottle pre-1920, I'd like to tell you, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really kind of heightened that aspect to it. It's given, the, as I said, you know, the boldness to it, the, you know, the heavy, oily kind of character. That probably wasn't there before. Now, for years, Pulteney was regarded as the northernmost distillery in Scotland, on the mainland. Those guys up on Orkney had a little bit of distance on you. And then these little upstarts up at Wolfburn, up in Thurso, just up the road, come in and take this title away from you. What's it like for those who have never been there and who will never be at Inwick or John O'Groats or any place up as far north as you can get in the, in the main part of the highlands what's it like up there ah it's, it's remote you know it's it's uh it's tucked away it's remote you know there's not a lot you know infrastructure in terms of roads and rail and, and airports to get you so we do have a quick international airport but it's, it's it's very remote for many many years many generations Pulteney were on its own okay and then a number of years back a few years ago uh, a guy called andrew thompson he resurrected wolfburn 
I think it's, it's great, to be honest. It's, it's fantastic to have neighbours. You know, we rely on each other. Even, you know, it's different when you get a product out in the market, there's a bit of competition. But when it comes down to my level, you know, in the actual production side, it's fantastic to have neighbours. And it's great to see the industry getting healthy, you know, when people are taking, you know, their own money and their own time to invest in these places, get them resurrected, you know, and then opening new places. It's, it's healthy, it's good, and it's fantastic to have neighbours. And, you know, we all help each other, you know. It's a family. It, uh, it has to be a family. And part of your extended family is the other four Inverhouse distilleries, and you've worked at all five of them. Let's go through each of them, and we'll do Pulteney last, since it's the one you have the most experience with. But let's start off with the one that people don't really ever get to hear a lot about, Balmenic. Oh, Balmenic, great wee spot. Grant on Spey, old distillery. It's, it's quite a big distillery. It was a very big distillery in its day, but it's the silent giant. You know, it's a fantastic whiskey. Uh, you don't see a lot of it going around. It's a again, it's a quirky distillery, and, and it, I think it's 115 or so working distilleries in Scotland. You know, there's only four of us had warm tubs, and Balmenic is one of them. And uh, you know, it, it's 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 this hopefully soon to be discovered next new one that's going to come onto the market. Hopefully, one of the. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I mean, I, I I'm only this is a wish list here. Like you know, I'd really like to see that happen. It really is deserving of it. And one of the others that has worm tubs is Spayburn, just up the road in Rothes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, round worm tubs. Uh, it's the you know the archetypal Speyside distillery. You know, it's it's all fruity. It's 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 floral. It's estuary. It's really packed there with that citrus notes coming through to it as well. Biggest producer within the group, run by a great guy Bobby Anderson. Fantastic. Knock do is unusual in a lot of ways and you sort of had to resurrect the past at Nakdu when you were running it right yeah I was asked to uh, you know 1894 it was distilled uh, built and it's it, you know it's a fairly old distillery and you know back in 2004 I spent six wonderful years there from 2000 to 2006 and I was asked in 2004 to kind of replicate you know Nakdu as it was but you know Strange ass. There's nobody around from 1894, and there's not very many bottles kicking about. But anyway, you know, we sourced local peat, local barley. It was all malted locally, but it was a uh, you know, knock is a very it's a very delicate spirit. You know, it's it's quirky, it's delicate, it's it's fruity, and it's something that you know we didn't really want to kind of mess about with. So we were very you know, caring not to disturb that spirit with it with the phenolics. So we we filled a you know a variety of styles of casks. You know, over the years that's been good on and, you know, we've introduced to the market, you know, a few expressions of it, rut, rut, you know, Rutter, Flouter, Tushker and uh, Raskan, which we experienced tonight. And we've also released a new one, which is Petart. So it, it was, a, it was a, you know, a nice balance with the, the you know, the, the aspects of not do as it is and how it was years ago. And you laid down a bunch of those spirits that we're now getting when you were manager there like these peated spirits, you, you talk about the delicacy of the spirit, and I've tasted the new make from Nakdu, but adding peat to that delicate spirit could have easily blown it out. Oh, very easy, you know, and that was one of the remits, you know, it's, you know, we wanted to re re retain that character, and that's why I thought, well, the best way to go about it is sourcing it as it would have been locally years ago. And so all the peat was cut within a couple of mile radius of the knock. It was malted in Port Gordon, which is, you know, 10 miles along the road, and then captured in, in there. So in essence, it was still taking the DNA out of the place, but still retaining the character. So it was a fine balance to try and to try and walk to get that right. And I think, you know, I think it's come out, and I think it's, it's such a well-balanced whiskey. You happy with the whiskeys that have come out that you laid down those years ago? Oh, it's, it's you know, how can I not be? You know, I mean, I... You know, there's been, what, 90 people here and we've all sat and enjoyed it. You know, when you're sitting there and knowing that you've a hand in the creation of that, you know, it's it's very, very humbling. And, you know, it just, you know, emphasizes that, you know, that there's a, a group of guys behind it and, you know, their work is recognized. Let's go up a little bit north up the A9 now to Bal Blair in Edgerton, uh, run by a man whose name I will not mention because he served me the worst whiskey I've ever had in my life. Um, the infamous Fishkey that he had that sample, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly what you're talking about, Mark. Yeah, Fishkey. Yeah, uh, that would say uh, that's a bit infamous, but certainly not a reflection on Bal Blair. John John McDonald's a sterling job there. You know, it's uh, you know it, it's a 
it's a great Highland whisky. You know, Paul Blair for me, the vintages they're just loaded with exotic fruit. You've got pineapple going on there. You've got also honey, citrusy notes. Beautiful little distillery. It has you know very low warehouses, slate roofs, and they really really capture that and they really intensify the flavours from that. But they do fantastic work. And I've got to note that John did that as a prank. He likes to do it as a prank with that fishy stuff. If he ever offers you a glass and asks you to taste it blindly, think twice before you do it because it's just likely to be that stupid fishy stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. When he blindfolds you, make sure you've got one eye open, to be honest. Like, you know, cause it, he you ever pull that one on you? No, no. I'm aware of it. <laughs> Hasn't done it yet, but hey, oh, you never know. And then your place up at Pulteney, which is your home now in Wick. Is that where you're going to finish things out, you think? Um, I, I really like, would, I, I would like to, yeah, I would like to. You know, it's home for me. You know, although I wasn't born there, I grew up there. So a lot of the guys that are on shift, you know, they were, I went to school with them as well. My wife's from these parts. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's home, it's home. So I, I would like to kind of finish everything off there. And then I've, I've still work to do there, and I would like to carry on doing it, to be honest. Like. What's it like when you're walking through the uh, distillery yard in the morning? when the breeze is coming in off the uh, sea and uh, the sun's just coming up. What's it like? Get, in, get inside quick. <laughs> uh, it's very breezy, it's wet. What we have in abundance of wick is a lot of wind and a lot of rain, you know. You know, we're 200 meters away from the North Sea. That imparts a lot of flavor into the, the style of Pulteney, you know. You know, you've got that salty coastal expression going on there. But it's a, it's a, it's a very quirky distillery. It's, it's very unusual, you know. In days gone by, it was actually outside of the town. But, you know, as the time, town grew because of the, the herring, it swallowed it up. So, you know, really, Pulteney, in its essence as it is now, can't really change much from what it is. You know, if we were, wanted to increase the capacity, basically, we'd have to knock it down and, and build it somewhere else, which is not what we we're going to do at all, you know. So it, it, really, you know, it, it really typifies the town of where we are and the area that we're from. You've still got a long ways ahead of you in this business, but how do you want to be remembered 20 years from now when, uh, when it's time for you to hang things up? Uh, how do you want to be remembered? What's your legacy going to be? Oh, I don't know. That's a oh, difficult question. You know, I'm, you know, you know, guys like myself and you know the guys that I know. You know, you're, it's a difficult question to say. The legacy I hope is, you know, I've. I've done what I've loved to do. I've done it with passion. I've done it with pride, along with a good bunch of guys. And I'll know over the years that people like yourselves are coming to events like this. They're sitting down. They're enjoying it. They're having a good time. They're evoking memories. They're making memories. And it's all to do with the craft of a dedicated team. That's the legacy for me. And it's hopefully it's the legacy that's going to carry on for time and time to come. Well, I think this 83 is a pretty good... Uh legacy for you. Cheers. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks. You'll find my tasting notes for the Old Pulteney 1983 vintage at whiskeycast.com. And back in June of 2011, Malcolm took us on a tour of Pulteney Distillery during episode 321. You can find that episode in the archives at whiskeycast.com. That's this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin which is bringing back the eight-year-old bottling that received rave reviews from whiskey lovers when it was released last year as a limited edition to celebrate Lagavulin's 200th anniversary. Look for it soon at a whiskey shop near you. And visit malts.com for more details. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. The holiday season is in full swing now, and I've received samples from a couple of different whiskey-related advent calendars over the last few days. Since Malcolm and I talked about Wolfburn Distillery during our conversation, let's look at one of the recent releases from the distillery in Thurso, just up the road from Wick. Aurora is one of the whiskeys in the Drinks by the Dram Scotch Whiskey Advent Calendar from Maverick Drinks. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and is matured in a combination of first fill X bourbon casks, Oloroso sherry casks, and second fill quarter sized casks. The nose is nutty and sweet with a good balance of roasted almonds, pecan pie, toffee, and marzipan. The taste has notes of raisins, blackberry preserves, almonds, coconut, honey, and a nice maltiness. And the finish is long with notes of toffee, orange peel, and 
a touch of figs. I'm scoring the Wolfburn Aurora a 90. Now, Samaroli's bottling of a Glen Talker's 17-year-old Speyside single malt distilled back in 1996 is part of the Scotch Whiskey Advent Calendar series from Canada's Secret Spirits. It was matured in an American oak cask and is bottled at 46% ABV. The nose on this one is fruity with peaches, red apples, apricots, muted spices, vanilla, honey, dried flowers, and just a touch of lemon zest that comes out slowly. The taste is thick and fruity with a good citrusy tartness and a hint of ginger, while touches of wintergreen and butterscotch add a nice balance. And the finish has a subtle tartness, but lasts for a long time. I'm scoring the Samaroli bottling of this 1996 Glen Talkers single cask a 93. More tasting notes coming up in just a minute. But first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, makers of Whiskey Advocate's 2017 Whiskey of the Year, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. The 12-year-old barrel-proof bourbon was pitted blind against competition from around the globe and was consistently ranked number one by the magazine's testers. Meet the whole Elijah Craig family at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. I recorded last week's episode in New Brunswick before the final tasting of the weekend, a vertical tasting of Port Ellen single malts led by Davin de Kergamo. Davin included a couple of old malt cask bottlings from Douglas Lang & Company, which historically had one of the largest stocks of Port Ellen casks held by any independent bottler. Both of these were bottled before Fred and Stuart Lang split the company in half several years ago and presumably split up the Port Ellen casks between them. There is one big difference between the two bottles that's apparent in tasting them. First, the 19-year-old Port Ellen 1982 single cask bottled in 2001 at the traditional old malt cask bottling strength of 50% ABV. The nose on this one has notes of driftwood smoke with a subtle peatiness, citrus tartness, butterscotch, honey, a sulfury flintiness, and just a touch of oak. The taste is thick and peppery with notes of butterscotch, grilled pineapple, lemon zest, and a touch of sulfur balancing out the black pepper. The finish has a long, gentle, smoky peatiness with honey and butterscotch to balance it. It's an amazing whiskey. I scored this one a 95. Now, the second Old Malt Cask Port Ellen bottling was also distilled in 1982, but this cask was bottled after 22 years as an exclusive for the Plowed Society, and if you think the keepers of the quake are secretive, you should see just how closed the Plowed Society is. This one was bottled in September of 2004 at cask strength, 61.1% ABV, and that extra strength makes a difference. The nose on this one is beefy and robust with notes of roast beef juices, a soft smokiness, smoked salmon, honey, butterscotch, dried flowers, and caramel candy. The taste is peppery and intense with a soft smokiness, honey and caramel candy sweetness underneath, and just a slight flintiness with a touch of dried fruits in the background. The finish is very long and peppery, slightly astringent and oaky with peat smoke, and adding some water opens up the sweetness on the palate and the smokiness on the nose. I'm scoring the Old Malt Cask 22-year-old Plowed Society Port Allen Bottling in 95, both are excellent whiskeys, and just an example of the difference bottling strength can make in a whiskey. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, and I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,000 whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our WhiskeyCast HD video segments and the WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast, there's a new episode of that one out this week as well. Our tasting panel in Fredericton tasted three single malt scotches. And give it a listen if you can. It's brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, events, cocktail recipes, and much more at whiskeycast.com, including a complete archive of all of our past episodes. Please take just a minute this week and leave some feedback for us or ratings on the WhiskeyCast page at Apple Podcasts 
iTunes, or wherever you download your podcasts from. Those ratings and comments do help other whiskey lovers find us when they're searching for new content online. You'll find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast, so we can keep that cask strength conversation going throughout the week. My email address is comments at whiskeycast.com, and I'd love to hear from you. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique. But a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2017, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.